into my basketball. Every time I rock, man, this is how we rap and rock. Peace to my man, now we got the camera out. Every time I spit it, cross over the all right hello everyone this is josh also known as yeshu we're just tuning into episode 67 of the tloy talks uh, podcast you know we're back and better than ever new studio new location i mean the same studio 1990 studios but you know just a new location better style better like freshness uh, for a bit too and you know i'm definitely gonna get it like started right here and all that you know so we actually have a very like interesting uh, guest in the building too and all that like a very like amazing box in a sense too i've seen like his ig reels and everything else too so i have my guy g right here how are you doing today man i'm good bro thank you josh appreciate it nice thank you for having me yeah man and like the last time we kind of like met and all that it was like um at we were at a uh, kensington market one time you know we just like i was just like finishing up the master inferno interview like a while back and then you know you were hanging out for him, with him uh, for a bit too and like we just tapped in communicated and just seemed like a dual process and all that you know so yeah and no, i was definitely fun chatting with you meeting with yeah. you i'm glad we got to link up and do yeah, this yeah for sure and you know having like this thing like all started right now and all that you know we'll definitely get your story started like it's an interesting story by the way too and like i want to start it from like the very beginning so you grew up in new york connecticut and you were also like born in canada so tell me more about those environments uh growing up but like as a kid and all that um so yeah i was born in toronto canada but when i was four my family took me to live in uh in in, in connecticut uh danbury specifically the city and while I was living in uh, Danbury, we're so close to New York that I would always just like venture off and get away there and uh, just hang out basically there and make connections, had a lot of fun. But uh, yeah. growing up in Danbury was very interesting. Um, it's not your average city. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, people who make it in the industry and don't. And it's very, it can be very cold, gritty, and it can be very normal, right? So it's like, it's something you wouldn't really expect from such a small town in such a small city. But uh, yeah, uh, Danbury's great. I uh, that's where I started my boxing career at, at a local youth center, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's my city for sure. It's home. Yeah, it's like close to like New Haven or like Hartford by any chance, or yeah, uh, I wouldn't say close, close, but there those cities are like around thirty five minutes to forty minutes away. They're um. They're, they're, they're nearby, yes, part of Connecticut for sure, uh, not New York. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And were they like kind of like big for sports like at the time growing up? I know like New York and Toronto, but like Danbury as well too? Uh, boxing in the other cities in Connecticut are big, yes. You have Bridgeport, Connecticut, Ortiz Boxing. You have Boxing and Faith out of New Haven. You have uh, Hard Knocks out of Hartford. So, yeah, it's, it's a big boxing state, I would say. Oh, uh, for sure, man. And... You know, growing up, were you kind of like into like boxing uh, growing up, or like when did that introduction like happen, like for boxing, like in that sense? Uh, boxing for me happened. It was really funny actually. Uh, I was a skateboarder. I started when I was like nine, ten years old, and I would go to this local youth center that that allowed uh, boxers, skaters, people after school, just a recreation center for people to go and do their thing. Yeah. And one day my stepdad walked in and he didn't really like like what I was doing. Yeah, yeah. He saw me and he yanked me off my skateboard and he brought me down to the um, to the basement yeah, where they had yeah. the boxing gym. And he's like, you're not going to do this, you're going to box. And literally like right away he put me to spar and fight who uh, my friend Ali Feliz, yeah, who's, yeah. who literally just made the Olympic team oh, uh, about a month ago. And he'll be fighting in uh, the next Olympics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I sparred with him. It was a very interesting experience for me. We both beat each other up. We yeah. both, you know, cry, whatever. We were just kids, right? Yeah, I went man. in with jeans. We weren't expecting this. But I ended up coming back and, yeah, loving the sport and just learning more and going further yeah. with it. Yeah. No, it's very, like, amazing to see. And, like, just, like, even knowing, like, how, like, skating, like, can change, like, in that sense, too, to boxing. So, like, in a sense, did you feel like, your stepdad like kind of like saved you from going to like a wrong path like at that time like uh i want to say that because i still unfortunately found trouble in the streets because where i'm from it's like if you're really in it a lot of people like to pretend to be in it right no matter where you are but i was really in it so when you're really in it no matter where you are you're always gonna find it so yeah. i unfortunately found like the streets and the bad side of yeah. it and and this and that but boxing definitely did keep me out of trouble for when i would get into trouble boxing would always get me out of trouble i, yeah. I could say that you know so yeah. boxing definitely saved my life in that sense no 100 too man and 
you know, just to kind of get more into the aspect of, like, your life, like, growing up. So what were you like as, like, a kid to, like, a young adult, like, at that time? And what did you uh, want to be, like, when you, like, grew up at first? Uh, as a kid, I, I, I wouldn't say I was the best kid. I was always a troublemaker, uh, getting in trouble, stealing cars, doing uh things i shouldn't have been doing for sure things things i could talk about on yeah, camera because yeah. I, I had to face the light uh yeah. selling drugs uh stealing cars you know and, and getting booked for these crimes young going to juvenile yeah. court but um uh, I, w- I would say i was always the the black sheep of my yeah. family i didn't really know how to be good and i never really settled for just being good and what i mean by that is just i unfortunately like just stayed more on like the darker side of yeah. what normal kids i guess would stay on yeah. the streets <laughs> yeah. yeah i know like with a lot of situations growing up too because like as kids and all that like anything like in your environment can like change you like from over time and all that too like you'll have like the private school kids like maybe at like hartford or like in other areas that'll only be expo- exposed to like private school life and all that too you have the kids from like the public schools and like from like the certain like income areas that are kind of exposed to certain stuff growing up and all that too and like you know it could change for like everyone over time too like that private school kid might be in the streets you know that kid like in public school might go to like an ivy league and all that too so it can like definitely change over time yeah uh and just add on to that yeah now my my family i did both my family definitely tried to keep me out of trouble putting me in private i did public also i got expelled in high school actually and i would always in private schools i always stayed in detention or suspended something but yeah. um yeah, no, just emphasizing what you're saying about uh, your environment or, like, what's portrayed. Yeah, no, Connecticut is so close to New York that we're so portrayed by, like, like all these rappers and all this gangbanging. Yeah. Uh, like, like growing up, I loved Chink's Drugs. That was my guy, Coke Boys. I got a tatted on because they were just such a big influence and major part of my, my youth growing up. And I, and I could speak for most people also throughout Connecticut. Like, those guys led the way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, Coke Boys was, like, a crazy, like, wave at that time. Like, Max B, French Montana, Chinx and all that. Like, rest in peace, like, Chinx and Sax Bundles and all that, too. Rest in peace. And, like, I know, like, a lot of kids, like, even in Toronto, were, like, listening to French Montana and Chinx and Max B, like, at a certain point in their life. Like, even way before French went, like, mainstream and all that. So, I feel like they've uh, led the way in terms of, like, getting people, like, influenced, like, in a lot of stuff and all that. Yeah, no, for sure. Free Max B, uh, rest in peace, Chinx. Rest in peace, Stack Bundles, because that's Riot Squad. They definitely were leading yeah. the way and um no nah, just they were they were uh, they were different than most music groups these days you you know that better than me like yeah. uh a lot of people aren't doing what they did so yeah and that was great what they did yeah nah for sure man and we'll definitely like speak more on that like later on too and all that and you know just getting into the whole like boxing ideal right now like what inspired you to become like a uh, professional like boxer and like you know go pro um like I said, growing up doing it so young, at you know, very young age, uh, seeing my local heroes uh, that were already pro and already fighting for titles and already on HBO, fighting on Showtime, ESPN. Um, shout out Delvin, Rod- Delvin El Peligro Rodriguez. You know, watching these pros and and just it was it was just something like it was a big rush. Uh, about seeing these guys fighting in the casino, seeing everybody cheer for them, seeing everybody love them, that really inspired me. And um, and then, like I said, watching my friend Delvin, even though he came up a little short, but it's still like an incredible fighter. Like he fought Austin Trout, who went to fight um, Canelo. He fought uh, Ares Landy Lara, who fought Canelo, yeah. and Canelo's like number one right yeah. now. Miguel Cotto, who's yeah. a legend. These guys are legends. Like yeah. so, seeing this firsthand was inspiring to me yeah. to continue forward and my amateur team back then shout out to champs boxing uh run by aj galante who's a phenomenal person by the way and gave me my head start with uh, introduction to the nationals and golden gloves um yeah it was just it was it was different seeing seeing these guys eventually turn pro doing their thing my, my friend omar bordoy he's a pro now also uh 13 and one and uh, seeing these guys chase their dreams made me want to chase my dreams even harder. And, uh, yeah, these guys are doing it, so now I have to do it also. Yeah, no, for sure, man. And, you know, it's amazing to see, like, with the influences that you've had, like, within, like, that whole, like, boxing career and all that, too. And, you know, I want to, like, actually get to start off, like, on your very first fight that you've had. And, like, with that, how did you train and prepare for that fight? And tell me more about that experience. Uh, my first amateur fight, I trained, like... Uh, 
Like, I always, my mindset to this day is always train like it's a professional fight or it's like a championship fight. Meaning, you know, you're waking up every day, you're running two, three miles, some days more, but realistically two, three miles every day, going to the gym, uh, spanning out your workouts. So between 30 minutes of doing dumbbells, 30 minutes push-ups, 30 minutes sparring, 30 minutes hitting the back, 30 minutes doing rope, 30 minutes um, shadow boxing. Uh, you have to put in a lot of hard work. I definitely would say I spend a few hours at the gym every time I go because, you know, hard work is pays off. Oh, true. And, like, I think for the first, like, amateur fight, did you actually win or? Yeah, I won my first oh, amateur true. fight. And that was what made me continue want to even pursue this even harder. Yeah. Um, it was against a guy from Hartford. Um, and I it, the fight was in Lowell, Mass, for the Golden Gloves uh, tryouts. And, uh, yeah, and I won a three-round decision, majority decision. And uh, I'll never forget it. It was just a very hard fought fight. Yeah. Like, how was, like, that high, like, you know, like, after experiencing, like, that win, like, in that sense, too? Like, I know you, like, kind of de debrief for a bit, too, because, like, sometimes, too, like, that high, like, after, like, winning a match, like, it could, like, last long until, like, the next match and all that, so. Um, it was, it was... As soon as I won the fight, the high was incredible. It was, like I said, the second you get out the ring, everybody's cheering for you. All the girls are looking at you. They're, everybody's taking pictures with you. They're already basically treating you like as if you already made it. And yeah. so, you know, that is good and dangerous at the same time because, unfortunately, in the beginning, I kind of got lost. Um, I got lost. I traded my passion for glory, like Rocky yeah. would say, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I went back home to my city. I was all over the papers. Um, everybody was like, everybody knew me. I could go literally anywhere in, in my city to eat and everybody just gave me free food, oh. free, she me VIP. So I unfortunately got a little lost in it, but those are the benefits that come with this sport, you know, when you're a warrior and it's so big where I'm from, the amateurs, that just for being an amateur, you got treated as if you were a world champion already. Yeah. Nah, for sure, man. And I know, like, with the mental versus, like, the physical, it's, like, kind of, like, a whole, like, different, like, pace in that sense, too. So how does your mental preparation differ from, like, the physical preparation? The mental preparation is something that I'm still training and learning from. Uh, shout out to my boy, Chino. Um, he's a fellow fighter from Scarborough. He's 13-0 and professionally. Uh, Chino Papichulo Assassin, they call him. Um, uh, J Jason Gallardo is his real name. Oh, true. But um, I re was recently training with him, and he spends a lot of time in Cuba. And as soon as we got done our sparring, he was making me do like, uh, like just like he's making me twirl around every 10, 15 seconds and stopping in one spot, like to make me dizzy. And I've never trained like that before, and it was new to me. And I was like, the first two times, I was like, what, what's going on? But then I started catching on that this exercise is performed to strengthen your mind oh, for when true. you ca get caught with a good shot, you know, how to, how to stay in the zone when you're buzzed. And then we moved on to, um, he would say, we're going to do some leg exercises to stay on your heels. And we were just punching each other's kneecaps. It's so like staying on top of each other, following each other, but staying on the kneecap. So... Uh, the mental preparation is different, varied on where you're at. And as far as me personally, I'm a I don't give a fuck type of person. Like, I'm just going to come in there to beat your ass humbly and respectfully. <laughs> like, yeah. like, because I, I do the work. If you're the better man that night, so be it. But yeah. I just, I have a, I don't give a fuck. My whole life, I've been sparring with, uh, with dudes a lot bigger than me, a lot heavier than me, a lot more experienced than me. And that's where most of my experience comes from to this day is just training with pros that are heavier. Because I fight at 115, 110, and unfortunately that's not a very big uh, or popular weight class. Yeah. So I have to, you know, mix around with all these heavier dudes, 120-pounders, yeah. 120 125 pounders, yeah. even super welterweights, 147. Yeah. Like I said, shout out my boy Justin. Yeah. Um, but you know what? I, I personally take it as a mental advantage yeah. because it makes me stronger. And, and eventually when I do get into a guy's my, my weight, I really don't, I don't feel nothing too crazy. Yeah, not sure. And has height ever become like an issue, like when it comes to like fighting and all that too? Because you're going to have people that are like 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 too, like six foot, you know, and, and they're facing like guys who are like 5'5", 5 5'4", 5 5 5 5'6", 5'7". Like has it ever? Um, unfortunately, yes. Yeah, sometimes I do come across some fights where I have to like, 
think about what strategy I'm going to use against the taller guy because just like short fighters have their own strategy on how to get on, on, on tall fighters, tall fighters have strategies on how to keep out short fighters. Yeah. So it doesn't matter like if you're a really good short fighter because if the guy's a really good tall fighter, he has his own strategy yeah. and game plan how to keep you out. And that happened to me in parliament when I fought there about six months ago because I fought downtown. Yeah. And kid, I'm going to keep it on with you. Kid wasn't that good. I try to introduce him to like to fighting me more on the on the inside. I try to I try to make him bring the fight to me. Yeah. But it was a learning experience. You know, I learned that I can't really force people to get out of their game plan to come after mine. So improvising is important in, in order to get my victory. But uh it's frustrating sometimes. Yeah. Like when I was fighting, like I said, down in parliament, it was frustrating because he would stay on the outside, use a good jab, but he was smart. He knew he couldn't bang out with me on the inside because I can brawl and I'm just really good at, at getting all that inside work done. Yeah, no, for sure, man. And, you know, usually, like, the pressures and the nerves, like, you know, before a fight, like, it can be, like, very, like, intense in a way, too. Some people, like, they may be, like, nervous, like, if it's, like, the first time or if it's, like, something, someone that they might not be confident in, like, handling. But for you, like, how do you, like, handle that, like, in a sense? Uh, the butterflies are always there. Any fighter that tells you they don't have it is just lying. I don't give a fuck how tough you think you are. Mike Tyson said it best, you know. Everybody's scared and everybody has a plan until they get punched. Me, personally, I, uh, I'm always nervous or whatever, but to be honest with you, the nerves go away, like, like, 20, 25 seconds before going into the ring. I usually start to, like, okay, like, it's happening, it's here. Yeah. Fuck it. And, like... All the preparation and all the training that we did, it's time to put that into effect, including the mental training also. So, yeah, um, yeah that's that's how I feel about that. <laughs> yeah, no, I know what you mean, man. And, you know, aside from, like, your first fight and all that, like, what was, like, your most, like, memorable, like, fight, like, in the sense, and, like, why it was, like, so special for you, like, at that time? So the first fight we talked about was uh, my first fight, but then it, it was the first fight that got me to qualify to continue fighting in the Golden Gloves. So for the Golden Gloves finals, um, that was really the fight that I remember the most and was one of my biggest victories was because uh, I won the Golden Gloves um, and the 108 uh, novice division. And it was it was a hard fight, man. I, I never thought I'd meet another short fighter like yeah. me that hit just as hard, that was just as hungry, that wanted it just as bad. And I did. I really had to, like, you know, fight my way through that. And uh, that's that was, I'd say, my memorable. Everybody came out to support me yeah. for that one. Um, like I said, my I made my manager at the time and, and uh, boxing promoter for the amateurs uh, proud. And I made my team proud. Yeah. And um, that's what I mainly, I mainly do it for, like, my fans or my, my family. That's, that's why I go in and get the victory for, to be honest. Um, and, like, uh, what's, like, your standing, like, right now? Are you, like... 50 oh like 40 10 or like your current like title like my, my record right now yeah. is eight and two into yeah eight and two uh true so i like the t a couple times like did you lost like like how did you manage like to prevent like those losses and like bouncing like back in that sense the losses for me i actually were i learned more from than my victories because whenever i lost the fight and this isn't me making excuses i i, I wasn't training properly and i was um doing things I shouldn't have been doing, like like hooking up with girls a night yeah. before a fight, uh, smoking at the same time, and just slacking on, on that work. And that's, that's, that's what I meant by, you know, when you change your passion for glory, sometimes you get lost, like they say, lost in the sauce. And I just, uh, I half-assed it. And any time I would half-ass it, it showed. But any time, Manny Pacquiao says it the best, you know, like the fights are won in the gym. So... As long as you train hard and work hard, you're always going to, like, come on top. That's my personal belief. Yeah, and I mean, boxing, man, it's, like, anything can happen to you. Like, even, like, one punch to, like, the cranium or, like, one punch to the liver, it could affect, like, your body in some ways, too. Like, with some people, I know, like, Floyd uh, Mayweather, like, I think, like, a lot of, like, the hits he had, like, from his head kind of, like, affected his, like, ability for, like, reading and all that. And, like, others, like, will have, like, like you know, natural, like, health con conditions with, Gastronomical, gast gastronomical issues like lung issues like after like getting those like hits and all that so like how do you even like handle like those injuries like when boxing um you're right unfortunately boxing is a sport where in the long term if you don't take care of yourself you can get um many diseases and body dysfunctions uh parkinson's being the main one um 
uh, what what can you do to to minimize that? Uh, I I could honestly say is, is be kind of more like Floyd in the sense where like he's a very good defensive fighter, one of the best that we'll ever see in this era, and minimizing the the damage put on you because a lot of fighters like to stand there take shots. I'm guilty of that, you know. I'm I'm tr actually training on my current coach to get out of that habit to take less punishment and and give out more punishment because boxing is a sweet science it's hit and don't get hit yeah no nah, for sure man and what do you consider to be like your greatest like strengths like one boxing in a sense uh i would say I'm, I'm i'm good at coming forward you can hit me with everything including the kitchen sink and i'm still gonna come forward yeah uh thank thank god i haven't gotten knocked out yet and i don't plan on getting knocked out anytime yeah. soon yeah or ever but um it's so like you said, boxing, anything can happen, so you really have to be yeah. aware. It only takes one shot to end the night. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, you just 100%, I would have to say, have to have everything in the game when you're yeah. when you're fighting. And I guess, like, speed and all that and everything else, too? Yes. Um, I have my, my personal good uh, capabilities are I know how to cut off the distance. Many pros have told me this. I know how to get on the inside. I have a good left hook. I have a great jab, and I have uh, I have power. I have power. I have power and speed. I need to get my speed up a little more right now, but um, because I'm changing weight classes slowly but yeah, surely. Yeah. But um, yeah, I I I, uh, I definitely wouldn't count myself out. I would honestly say I'm one of the world's best flyweights and featherweight fighters, yeah. like for sure yeah, you know no, and when sure, my time man. comes to show that i'm gonna definitely demonstrate it yeah no for sure man i'm just gonna halt like the boxing questions out for a bit too to just mm -hmm. kind of get more onto like other topics as well too so you know you moved to toronto as we like kind of talked about like before like the like podcast and all that so mm -hmm. like when you like moved to toronto like after like a very long time like in the states and all that what were like the differences that you've noticed like when living in toronto versus like in the states and all that and how do you even like feel about like the quality of like life in toronto in a sense uh, that's a really good question. So unfortunately, I thought Toronto was pussy and just like a soft city because being an ignorant statesman, that's that's how we're that's how we that's a perception of not just Canada or Toronto, like the whole world. But when I got here, the city definitely humbled me. I I didn't know what the city was about actually. I didn't know anything, and I had to learn the hard way. But eventually, I learned that you know through the hard times, I, you know I found love, and now this is my home. And when I will be fighting, I will be representing Toronto and Canada now, and uh, I love it. It's um it's an incredible city. Uh, Toronto is very unique and diverse than any other place that I've been to so far, and uh, I honestly am gonna stay here. You know I'm not gonna go back. Yeah. I'm, I, it's my new home and. You know, it's it's been so welcoming, and let me tell you some. You know, this city, the city don't play. You know, this, yeah. you know, it, it's it's um, yeah. it's a very headstrong city, and anybody yeah. that is gonna be ignorant, like I was in the beginning, to think anything otherwise, gonna find out the hard way. You yeah, know, this no. there's true G's here. Yeah. There's real there's real G's here, and there's just um, it's a phenomenal city yeah, no, full of winners. Man. Yeah, I think like with Toronto, like it's just an amazing vibe. Like wherever you go, like for people who were born here and all that, like some people might not be like a fanatic of it because they've seen all that and all that. But people who do move here, like they do tend to have like an interesting like outlook of the city just by meeting the people, just like knowing the vibes and all that too. And like, you know, even like in some, like for the music scene too, like I don't know if you've actually managed to like tap in like to the Toronto music scene, like knowing like some artists and stuff like that too. Uh yeah, I've tapped in and I'm yeah, I've tapped in. That's all I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say uh Toronto has its own style that I think again is just on another level. It's really cool. It should be exposed more and get out there more because it's not like any of the music that it gets heard back home. Back home, it's glorified more from here or anywhere yeah. else, right? But I don't agree with that anymore after living here yeah. and like I said, being um being shown like it, like all the diverse music yeah. that's out here or an artist. Yeah. Uh, I would say that the music scene out here is different. It's really good. I have a you know a lot of a lot of famous yeah. rappers that I like now and that I communicate yeah. with. That again I'll just leave at that. But um yeah. um I love it. I, I actually absolutely love it, yeah, the music out here. And, you know, knowing that, like, you're, like, Ecuadorian and all that, you told me, like, that earlier and all that, there was, like, a dope, like, Ecuadorian, like, scene in Toronto, like, with Chromas, with 
YBA. Like Where you this, at? Where you at, mommy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, this kid named uh, Cholokash that kind of hangs out with, like, Chromas here and there and all that. And, yeah, I mean, there's a dope, like, Latin scene here. You know, like, a lot of uh, people are, like, tapping in from there, from the nightclub scene to, like, the real estate. So... I see, like, a lot of, like, the Latinos, like, gaining in that and, like, even with the media sub, too. So it's amazing to see. Yeah, yeah. No, for any Ecuador, no matter where they are doing, whatever they're doing, uh, especially in Toronto, I've already seen. I'm just nothing but proud of my people and my country. So to Chromaz and whoever else that's, you know, holding it down out here, all I got to say is just keep it up, you know, because Ecuador is where it's at. Yeah, man. And... As far as, like, you know, with everything uh, else uh, right now, like, you also talked about, like, being, like, a ladies' uh, man in that sense, too. So how did that, like, initially start and all that and, like, getting in, in, into, like, now? Um, I'm not I'm not the best-looking man in the world, but I, I do know my way with ladies. How did that happen? I don't know. I just, um, all I'll say on that is uh, when I was young, I had my heart broken one time, and all I said to myself was I'll never let a woman make me feel like that again and just... I learned how to be very charismatic with women, how to be very relatable to women, how to understand women. And as soon as you can get past all that and just keep it 100 and be real and be confident with yourself, I believe any man has any chance at being a ladies man, quote unquote. Yeah. But uh, yes, I, I do have it good with the ladies because I love the ladies, you know, so where yeah. you give love, you're giving love. <laughs> yeah, man. Like, how do you uh, rate the Toronto, like, women uh, nowadays and all that? Like, I know, like, it's a booming scene right now with the women and all that, so. Uh, the Toronto women, I love them. Uh, they're awesome, uh, especially their lingo. Uh, I'll rate them as fun. I'll rate them as 10. And actually, Toronto has, LeBron James said this, uh, Toronto has literally some of the world's most beautiful women, even Back home to New York, like yeah. the, the scene here is amazing because um, it's so diverse. You know, you have all these beautiful women from India, all these beautiful women from Somalia, yeah, from yeah. Ethiopia, yeah, from bro. all these countries. Yeah, so I, when I got here, I was personally introduced to races that I've never tangled with before. And I've gotten to learn a lot of uh, cultural, uh, I don't know, like cultural stuff, yeah, yeah, insights, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I think that's like everywhere you go, you know, like with the food, with the language, with mm -hmm. what they do, and all that. Like a lot of people can like diversify and like what the, what they do and all that, and just kind of works out from there. Whether you're going out for a tea, or going out to a movie, or going out to like a festive like karaoke thing, all that type of thing. Like just kind of works out from there and all that. So yeah. Yes, I agree one hundred percent. All right, to get back into boxing uh, right now, like, you know, with the professional life versus, like, the personal life and all that, like, what's that, like, balance like, uh, like when while, like, training for, like, fights and all that? Well, I'm in training right now for my first pro fight, but, like, again, I've treated every fight as a professional fight since I have started this uh, career a long time ago. All I would say, nothing really different other than training harder, um, being more disciplined staying motivated and you know when life throws you any type of curveballs uh it's not easy to stay motivated or disciplined yeah. i currently don't smoke i had to give up smoking i don't drink anymore i just um i'm just focused on the goal because i'm turning 27 this year yeah. and i've realized that i'm not going to be young forever and especially for a sport like boxing i need this young body behind me and i need a you know i need a it's a it's a now or never type of scenario yeah. but um yeah, yeah that's yeah. that's how i look at it oh for sure and i know like in a lot of cases too like some people who have like those vices it is like kind of like a way for like happiness and stuff like that too but you know just kind of like giving it up for a while to be prepared like how do you even like maintain that positivity and that motivation like during that career like while like handling like those like fights and all that i would say it just comes with time and maturity because uh Again, being younger, I I've, I've been through a lot. Not, not I'm not gonna say we all been through whatever we've been through. You know, I've been through a lot, also. So I'm at a point now where I just um, I don't really have time to keep messing up. I don't have time to keep restarting over and over again. I'm at a point where like, you know, like if I start smoking or if I start drinking and and I know it's gonna throw off my mindset. Do, do I do I really want to do that? Can I afford to be set back? 10 50 steps again no so the discipline there is easier now because i'm locked in on what i want i'm locked in on my goal and i know what i gotta do to get there so i believe that once you can get these things down 
any human being like that's how you follow and pursue and achieve your dreams oh for sure man and you know like earlier on we talked about you know you being like with like danbury with, with their like training team and all that too so you know like just like in that sense too like i was like you know even being in that like training team just like meeting up with those people like at that start and then meeting up with like other like training teams and all that um in the beginning it's like i don't know if it's like a, a young and mature thing but like I, like I said, when I when I was with these guys, I was very young, dumb, and immature. Um, I didn't really know what I had and like and like who who I was under and like how like plugged up I was. Again, I started mm -hmm. with, I started off locally by myself, but I caught the attention of like, again AJ Galante, who's yeah. on Netflix right now, Crimes and Penalties. Yeah. He's an incredible manager and promoter. Yeah. Um, I believe still current owner of the Danbury Trashers. Yeah. Shout out Trashers. And, um, but, but he, when he got out of the whole, um, hockey thing, you know, he started the boxing thing and I was fortunate enough and lucky enough to yeah. be there at the beginning and at the start of that, especially when champs yeah. opened up. Cause he owns, he owns a boxing club called yeah. champs boxing at a Danbury. Um, and starting off there was, was, was good. Incredible. Like I said, he got me into the amateurs. He took me from being like a local guy that trained boxing that was you know getting his name out there by doing his thing to like i said to becoming more official to, to getting me into the golden gloves to having me fight in the golden gloves winning the golden gloves to to pursuing the the nationals yeah. fighting in the nationals you know being with terence crawford's nephew and all these other stars yeah. you know youngins yeah. that yeah. are competing to make it to the top at their level so yeah. um how it was was good it was, it was it was a really good experience that i wish i would have taken more seriously yeah, but sure. you know what I, I still take what it what I learned from there and being and sparring with all these guys because it made my boxing IQ higher than than um than most to be honest. Yeah. And it leads you to like meeting like other people like within that whole like boxing like scene, you know, with the Ryan Garcias and all that and the Javante like Davis uh, Davises and all that and then it like leads you to meeting like other like boxers and other people like within that scene too with um even like with the coaches too so like there's like a lot yep. of like famous coaches like nowadays who've trained for like tyson and like everyone else doing all that so yeah yeah no I, I agree uh when i was boxing amateur i met uh when i'm fighting the nationals i met terence crawford oh. i was the only one that noticed him because i was like a big boxing fan yeah. and he was sitting in the crowd had the big hat on and i'm like i remember telling my everybody's always like when they get kind of starstruck and they're like, no, I don't want to. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the opposite. I'm like, yeah. I have to go see that guy. I have yeah. to go thank that guy. I have to go shake his hand. Yeah. Um, and so I, I noticed Terrence Crawford was in the stand because his nephew was fighting in the Ringside World yeah. Championships 2017, I believe. And when I shook his hand, I swear I caught this vibe that did not leave me until, like, I got home and started smoking again. That's why I say, like, I learned, that's what I learned about, like, being disciplined is that, like, once you're on that wave, you got to be real careful about, you know taking whatever steps back but anyways when i when i when i shook his hand and i looked at him and you know he was showing me love i, I was just like this guy just be uh pascal who was the wbc silver champion yeah, i yeah. believe and it was a big deal and you know just seeing my hero in person was was incredible and shout out to terence crawford yeah. who just be errol spence and what was what should have been yeah. uh 2023 fight of the year but yeah like it, those experiences i'll never forget and just to add on to that i met a lot of coaches in different parts of but different cities in connecticut yeah. that like i'll never forget and a lot of them unfortunately fighters passed away and like I feel like I have to say their names because I have to shout them out because they were such a big part of my life. Like in New Haven, my boy Deshaun um, trained with Chad Dawson, who was a WBC world champion also. Unfortunately, he passed away. He he got shot in the head during a dice game because Connect people sleep on Connecticut. People don't understand how grimy and gritty yeah, Connecticut is. Yeah. So rest in peace um, to my boy Deshaun. Rest in peace to my boy Kevin Bonilla, who also unfortunately was a gunshot victim. In New Haven, and uh, rest in peace to Luis K.O. Rosa, who uh, was 29 and one professionally, fought on Showtime all the time, and it, it, this guy was my hero, man. Like, I think about these dudes a lot because, like, who am I to still be here chasing my dreams when these guys were way better fighters than me? These guys were way ahead of me, and like, what sucks, like. I don't want to say sucks, but like what's unfortunate hurts me a lot is that 
my boy Rosa, when he passed away, like, he was undefeated. But, like, after his first defeat, like, in the ring, I, I don't know, like, like he, he died in a car accident. But, like, it was just so weird to me, like, your first loss and then you pass away, like, so suddenly in a car accident. Like, it makes me question, like, if these guys were depressed or, like, or, like, like if he was depressed, yeah. excuse me, and he didn't know, like, where he was yeah. going, like, how big he was or how much of an idol he was to people yeah. like me and everyone else. But yeah. I really miss these people a lot, these dudes a lot, and they, they played a big part in my life. No, for sure, because, like, as we, like, even, like, mentioned about, like, mental preparedness and all that, too, anything can happen, like, when it terms, like, when it comes to, like, the mental injuries and everything else, too, because same with CT and all that, like, with the forces, like, happening to your head, you know, with the throbbing and everything else, too. Sometimes, like, that mindset, like, even with the oxygen and even with the brain fluids, it could, like, alter our mindset, like, more, like, differently and all that. And there were, like, a lot of, like, CTE victims, like, whether it's, like, from boxing or from football, that have led to, like, other situations, too, and, like, they had to use, like, other stuff to kind of be in a better element to get away from, like, all the pain and all that, too. And just even with everything, like, going on uh, right now, from the start until now, like, what does it mean for you to be, like, a fighter after, like, even, like, at this point? Uh, what it means to me to be a fighter is that's all I know, unfortunately. Like, I'm just a fighter. Um, I have a goal and I have a purpose, and it's to fight. That's all it is, is to fight. Just boxing. I don't glorify anything else, you know, like street fighting or whatever, but I'm, I'm definitely a fighter. Um... My purpose is to fight. That's all I know how to do. Yeah. You know, it's ever since I was a kid, that's all I know how to do. That's where I found love. It's better than sex and drugs. I yeah. just, I love boxing. Boxing yeah. is my life. Yeah, man. And, you know, even with the valuable, like, lessons, like, from, like, fighting and all that, what were, like, some ones that you, like, took away? And, like, has it, like, ever, like, reflected, like, in real life, too? Like, even outside of the ring and all that? Yeah. Um, discipline. Because when you carry yourself with discipline... It's like Floyd Mayweather is always saying also discipline, hard work, dedicated. Discipline is, is good in any aspect, you know. Like, I'm always on a TTC. Someone's always looking at me because, like I said, I got tattoos, whatever. They're like, hey, pussy, whatever. True power is self. And my mom told me this. True power is, is, is self-restraint, you know. Yeah. Like, like sticks sticks and stones may, may hurt me, but, but words can't break me, right? Yeah. So... Um, I learned that, you know, with discipline, having good mental restraint uh, in any aspect, like I said, ignoring people when they talk to you, um, knowing how to analyze situations. Um, that's what I took from boxing, honestly, like it just to be a more calmer person outside yeah. and just analyze. Yeah, man. And yeah. I know like nowadays, too, like it also like there are like a lot of like reflections to that kind of show like within the value of life, you know, like appreciating like others and like appreciating just like many things in life and all that to be alive to this day to like even having that time to you know seek family like i think um there's like this quote like on like the godfather 2 and all uh, on the first godfather movie mm. like a man who doesn't spend time with his like family is not like a real man too so even there are like a lot of like quotables nowadays like even like just like even being around like people that you consider family you know like do you feel like even if it's like an amazing uh, reflection in that sense too? Yes, yes, and I would agree with that quote. Um, good quote. Uh, I'm always whenever I'm not like nowadays. Whenever I'm not training, I'm always with my daughter. I just had a daughter five months ago. Different feeling, different vibe. Love it. If if anything, I add on to it. It saved me more. It took me more away from the streets. Um, yeah, family's family's very big, very important to acknowledge in any aspect, whether it's boxing or your yeah. own personal life or rap game, whatever. Family keeps you grounded. Family is everything. And um, it doesn't just always have to be blood family. It could also be like my coach is my family. When I yeah. when I got arrested out here in Toronto for, you know, getting caught up, whatever I got caught up in, I, I was put on a bracelet and... The only dude there for me was my coach, my boxing coach. My boxing coach was like, yo, we got to get back to this boxing, keep you out of trouble. Yeah. It's just like the States, you know, like you were getting in trouble over there. What saved you? Boxing. Yeah. So my coach to me is my mentor. My coach to me is my hero. Um, he's an old school kung fu guy from Grenadia. Yeah. Uh, very skilled and knowledgeable in the arts of combat, especially boxing. And... Uh, that's that's one of the people also I cherish um, highly in my life that, you know, has done a lot for yeah, me. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, getting back into, into this whole idea of, like, 
you know, the incarceration and the criminal justice system, like you talked briefly about it. So mm-hmm. even like what was like that experience, like, you know, being incarcerated for some time or even being on probation or even like dealing with something and like what advice would you give to others to not like fall into those footsteps of someone who has done like time in a sense? Uh, when I was in the States, again, I don't like talking about nothing too much, but I, I keep it brief, like getting caught up with drugs and gangs. Um, I would say just don't glorify that type of stuff, you know, seeing dudes on TV rapping and yeah. like the streets. Now there's a there's an old quote right like you can you can take me out the hood but you can't take the hood out of me and I'm a victim of that myself you know like yeah. we addicted to the spotlight we addicted to the girls we addicted to the cars the fast money the fast life but eventually like I will say this understand that 99.9 percent of that is bullshit understand that you know there's more to life and that real G's move in silence. Yeah. And real G's don't yeah. get caught. Like, I, 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 I'm, I'm glad I can say this on the record because I do want to save a lot of young people's lives by saying what I'm about to say. Yeah. Don't glorify this bullshit you see on music videos. All these dudes busting out all these bills that may be real, and even if they're like, I, I don't hate on nobody, but like, like I said, most of the time, it's all this shit is just fake counterfeit money. They're yeah. sending out the wrong message. They're glorifying catching bodies. I, these are people like I said at the end of the day that if they're real demons, shout yeah. out to them for being real demons, but. A real demon to me and a real a real gangster to me is a man, like I said, that takes care of his family, that doesn't put his family through suffering, and that doesn't have to go to no funerals, and that's just keeping yeah. it 100. Yeah. That's keeping it 100. Because, yeah. you know, the message out here and anywhere is is being uh, is being distributed the wrong way, yeah. you know? And it's not, yeah. it's not fair to our young youth that look up to these, you know, these music entrepreneurs and these music industries and and just that are paying all yeah. this money making them rich and yeah. for what you know for the cost of their lives come on yeah. man no nah, for sure it's man. deeper than that no 100 percent too and now you you were spot on right there too because like a lot of kids like kind of get influenced into the wrong path and all that and you know it could like lead to one thing or another you know like just like that whole like destruction into a path that you know it takes years to like rebuild and all that like once like you're in that chain once you get out you know like it'll be hard at the end you know housing jobs like all that type of stuff too i think it's like already like explainable and other stuff too but now nah, you put it like correctly in a sense too you know so. trust me bro I, like i said i just said on to that like i know a lot of people have been a lot of scenarios again i'm i'm, I'm keeping it so gangster that i know how i'm gonna yeah. talk about and illustrate yeah. it like i said not everybody's your friend and when you're looking at that judge and you're li- you're listening to them numbers you'd be surprised that the, the, yeah. the, your best friend your homie your day one next to you will throw you under the bus. You'd be surprised, yeah, you know, man. like, yeah. everybody want to be a gangster until they got to sit in front of that judge. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, Hundo P, man. Nah, I definitely know what you mean, you know, and we just have, like, these, like, couple, like, questions uh, left in that sense, too, but, you know, what do you want to be remembered for at the end of your career, like, once you get to, like, a certain point? I want to be remembered as being real, as being a hundred, as, like, Flamel would say, but in my own sense, uh, not being scared to live how you live, you know, being who you are. And that's it. And just that I tried my best. For sure. I kept it 100 no matter what. You know, oh, I never sure. fucked my man's girl. I never snitched on nobody. I never, you know, I never ate a plate, you know, while, while the man next to me didn't have no food. You know, I always broke bread. I just did my best to always be 100 and real with everyone. Uh, for sure. And to kind of answer, like, these, like, ones, like, briefly, if you could have, like, one dream fight with anyone, who would it be? Oh, man. Damn, that's not spot on. Uh, uh, Bam, Bam, Bam. Bam, Bam? Uh, 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 Jesse Rodriguez, ah, who I called out, and he blocked me on social media, <laughs> which makes no sense because he's, like, 27 and old professionally and has, like, 200K <laughs> followers. And I'm a nobody, and this guy just blocked me out of nowhere, which uh-huh. is which kind of is good because it means I'm getting in his head because... Yeah. Like I said, one thing about boxing is it's like Rocky. Yeah. It'd be these nobodies that be coming out of nowhere like me defeating these guys because, like I said, at the end of the day, these guys are at the top. They they, they lose their passion. They, they're not as hungry anymore. So, like, he, I have everything to gain and nothing to lose, and he has everything to lose. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not 100% too. But anybody can get it. Yeah. Anybody can get Anyone. it. 108, 115. One to even one twenty soon eventually ninety five pounds like they can all get it. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah, Hundo P. And if you could describe it in one word, how do you see the current state and future of the sport of boxing? 
Um, it's getting better now. A lot of people like it's so business uh, oriented now. Like a lot of people are scared to fight each other. I don't know if it's business. I believe mostly it's business now. Like because boxing is so complicated in a sense, bro. Where like if you don't understand the sport, you're like, why aren't these guys yeah. fighting each other? Why aren't you got like Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather yeah. for the longest time? They avoided each other and nobody knew why they weren't fighting. Yeah. And in the end, like after watching so many interviews, uh, Oscar De La Hoya, Golden Boy Promotions, and and yeah, and 100%, yeah. you no. you understand that money makes fights. Not <laughs> so even if two guys really want to fight, it has to make sense money wise. Just yeah. like Gervonta Davis and David Haney right now, yeah. they don't want to fight each other because they're they're saving each other for the future to have a bigger. Uh, bag a purse, exactly, yeah, a bigger purse. I mean, Jake Paul, KSI, because oh, it's kind of more of a memed out thing because you've seen these people on t YouTube like doing boxing right now. Jake Paul, KSI, Logan Paul, um, who else? Like Neon, Blueface, Anneli Shapa, like all these people. Now they're getting into the ring and now they're known as like professional boxers now versus like others who've worked like all their life to kind of be at that point and all that, so... Th those guys aren't real fighters. They may think they are. Like I said, some, like they, if you ask me personally, we're all fighters. We all have that fighter inside of us. Yeah. I'm not going to knock these dudes for doing what they're doing, especially Jake. Like Jake Paul beat some guys he should have never beat. Yeah. So like I said, like that's what I'm trying to say, right? Nobody's become yeah, some yeah. somebody's in, yeah, in sport nah, boxing. Too, yeah. Th these guys, but if you ask me like who they, what they really are, they're, they're genius entertainment people because yeah, exactly. They knew and understood that coming into this industry and having, you know, XX amount of followers or XX yeah. amount of supporters, like Jake Paul fighting Floyd Mayweather, it made a lot of money. 100%. Or Logan Paul, I'm <laughs> yeah, sorry. It was exactly. Logan Paul. Yeah. Uh, Logan Paul, it made a lot. Like I said, that's boxing, unfortunately. Yeah, like, it's 100%. just, yeah. if it makes sense money-wise, they're going to make it happen. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Too. Yeah, no, 100%. And, you know, just for, like, this, like, last question right here, like, what advice would you give to someone who's just, like, starting out in the sport of boxing and all that? Um, I would say train hard. I, I would say what Gervonta, Do uh, what Gervonta Davis told me when I was really young, years ago on Instagram, he replied to me. I I'll never forget it. I said, just tell me one thing. Tell me one thing. What do I have to be to be in the position you're in? And he literally replied just like this. Work hard, young brother. Work hard. So just train hard, work hard, and um, and keep going because when the day you stop and like you think you're not about to be there, that might have been the day you're gonna be there. You know what I'm saying? It, it, everything is coincidental. Like, like you know, you never know who you're gonna bump into. And yeah. I was living in New York. I was in Chinatown one night, just fuck around, my friend smoking. I ended up literally just walking randomly into an alleyway. I met Fat Joe. Like you never know who you're gonna exactly. meet or see, <laughs> yeah. so you always gotta be ready, you know, to yeah. to network or just train and 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 publicize yourself. Cause being a boxer, your own business. So start your business off correctly. Learn, learn the insides yeah. and outs, not just the fighter part. Learn the promotion part, the management part, because that's where a lot of dudes get screwed yeah. at. I know a lot of dudes that you know got messed up that way also. But like you know, you definitely gotta watch this. This is why David Haney. And I believe, I don't know if Javante Davis did he have some, but I know David Haney, he started his own company. I know Floyd Mayweather eventually broke off from top rank and started Mayweather promotion. Yeah. So manage yourself, promote yourself, yeah. you know. Uh, be careful with the Don Kings. There's a lot of Don Kings yeah, out here. exactly, man. No, a lot of scammers yeah. either way, you know. And I think that's just going to be, like, the closing remark for now. Uh, if people want to, like, want to, like, follow, like, your socials and all that, like, where can, like, they find you? Uh, Ghetto Assassin 6 on Instagram. And I'm just always around the city of Toronto. If you see me, it ain't nothing but love. I'm a cool dude. I'm humble. So just shout out to everybody chasing their dreams. Shout out to Josh. Shout out to the man behind the scenes. And uh, thank you very much for having me. You know, it ain't nothing yeah. but love. Yeah, man. Gee, you know, it's a pleasure, yeah, like, man. tapping in and all that. You know, it's actually, like, setting this up for, like, the very first time, you know. Because we were supposed to do it, like, last year and all that. But, like, a lot of stuff go went on and all that. But Life. Now, like, <laughs> exactly. And, like, now we have it, like, all set up. Like, the first actual podcast of the year and you know it's been good work so far and all that and you know this is josh also known as yashu of episode 67 of tila white talks so you can get it like on all platforms and all that spotify apple podcasts youtube much more you'll listen to it on other areas as well too and like you're gonna see a lot of these like so far and all that so definitely tap in definitely like tap in with g as well too like check out the highlights everything like that and yeah that's all i could say right now you know this is josh 
also known as Yashu, episode 67. Tilo I Talk signing off.